going to be great. Well, it's great to be with you. You all made it through the blizzard. You made it through the ice. You made it through the snow, and you're here. It's so good to be with you, right? I don't know about you, but last week I felt displaced. I almost felt a little depressed on Sunday. I didn't know what to do with myself, all right? And so it's so good that we got to come together today to worship. And um, believe it or not, but we are at the end of our series in Ephesians. Isn't that amazing? So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We've been in this book, this letter, for a while now. And like I said, this is the end of Ephesians. And the end of a good thing is never fun, is it? I want you to think of the last amazing dessert you had. Picture it. Can you taste it still? That last bite is so bittersweet, isn't it? Because you want to take it, but then after that, it's gone. The end of a good thing is never fun. What about a great vacation? You're at the end of a great vacation. Traveling home is just so sad sometimes because that vacation was so great. You wanted more days. What about a good movie? At the end of that movie, sometimes you just want to see more and you wish that the storyline would continue. What about the end of a good beach day? You're at the end of, you're fried, right? You're all red and there's more fun to be had. Why do we have to go home, correct? So the end is never fun. And that's where we are here in Ephesians with the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Uh, But when we come to the end of Paul's letters, many Bible readers just kind of blow past them as if they don't really matter, all right? We blow past them as if they don't really matter. We don't think much about what's being said because a lot of his letters involve final greetings. They involve shout outs to other people. They involve benedictions that we've already heard and what he's already said those things. Or they're just a couple of sentences that Paul wrote himself. But if we just blow past these verses in this letter, we are doing ourselves a huge disservice. Because in his letter to the Ephesians, the final verses, Paul beautifully buttons everything up for us. His whole letter was focused on two things. And that's what the tagline is right here. You see here, it's, the whole letter was focused on, the first half was focused on the gospel truths, chapters 1 through 3. Who God is and what God has done for us. But then... He transitions in chapter 4 to then talk about our gospel living. So the gospel truth then should motivate the way that we live in our lives, that we should walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And so listen, if we don't know the gospel truths, then our gospel living doesn't make sense. And if we don't do the living, the gospel living, then the truths apparently don't mean anything to us. And so our whole series was focused on the gospel truths motivating our gospel living. And if you haven't been with us, and you can go back to our YouTube page and listen to all these messages, but let me just recap where we've been in the letter of Ephesians. And so first, let's focus on the truths that we should know. And this list is not exhaustive. We only took 16 weeks to get through this letter. We've, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones took four years to get through Ephesians, okay? And so this list is not exhaustive. There's a lot more that we could have learned here, but we wanted to work through pretty quick. So the truths we should know, first, the grace and peace of our Father who is in heaven. We need to know the grace and the peace of our Father of who is in heaven. Second, we learn that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Third, we learn that our praise should then lead to prayer. If you remember after the whole spiritual blessing section in chapter 1, he then, his praise of God, of who God is, led to prayer for the people in Ephesians. Then we learn that apart from Christ, we are dead, but with Christ, we are made alive so that we can walk in good works. Next, we learn that we were once alienated strangers with no hope, but through the blood of Christ, we are now citizens of God's kingdom, members of God's family, and stones in God's temple. And last, we learn that there are right things to bring with us as we walk on our journey of faith. 
These are the truths that we learned, and this is the, actually the last one. We also learned that we need to be strengthened with power, rooted and grounded in love, and be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you guys remember all that? Right? Probably not. That's okay. But that's where we've been, all right? This is what we've learned so far. These are the truths that we learned through this book in Ephesus. But, but remember, these truths aren't just there for us to have this head knowledge. They should absolutely permeate our hearts so then it comes out in our lives. So then how should we live in light of these truths that we learned? Well, let's see. First, we, we looked at and saw that we must walk worthy of our calling while cultivating unity through our character, our confession, our gifts, and our maturity. And so we walk worthy by, by cultivating unity in our lives. Second, we must walk worthy of our calling by being different and living different. Being different and living different. Because you are different through Christ and we need to live different because of Christ. Next, we must walk worthy of our calling by walking in love, light, and wisdom. We must walk worthy of our calling in our lives and marriages by submitting ourselves to each other in love and respect. We must walk worthy of our calling in our you know, families and at work by giving them Jesus and working for Jesus. And then a few weeks ago, we saw that the fight is upon us. The fight is upon us, so be strong in the Lord with his armor on while standing firm in his power through prayer. The gospel truths should be motivating our gospel living. So ask yourself, is this happening in your life? Is what you know about God, who he is and what he's done, motivating how you live and how you treat and love people? To end his letter, Paul dovetails everything together by ending exactly where he began. He ends with a blessing of grace, peace, love, and faith. And then he leaves us with one vital question to ponder. Now, before I get to the question that we're going to ponder, today is going to be a, 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 a day where I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. And so I pray and I hope that you are honest with yourself today. Be honest with yourself and be open to looking deep within your own heart to truly think about the questions you're going to be asked. But Paul is going to leave us with one question as we end this letter of Ephesians, and it's this. Do you love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love? So with that in mind, let's read Ephesians 6, 21-24. Paul says, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. It's here that Paul probably took the pen from the scribe and finished the letter in his own handwriting. He did this often, and he did this to authenticate that the letter was truly from him. Because in some of the other letters, uh, you kind of get the gist that some people claim to be from Paul or write things from Paul, but it's really not from him. So he takes the pen, and he usually kind of finishes off the letter himself. He does this in, to the Corinthians. He does this to the Galatians the Colossians, and the Thessalonians. And again, he wanted to make sure people knew that what was written to them was from him, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's how he described himself in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Meaning that this letter absolutely has authority over this church and that they should listen to these words. And so now the question we see here, if he took the pen from his scribe, then the next question we could ask is, who was his scribe who physically wrote the rest of the letter? 
Now, we don't really know, but it could have been a guy named Tychicus. Did you guys see his name there? It could have been him. We don't know. That's speculation, okay? Uh, Whether or not it's him, we do need to ask this question, who is Tychicus? Can you guys say that with me? Tychicus, right? I had to listen to the Bible app to know how to say his name, okay? So that's a trick. If you don't know how to say their names in there, just go listen to someone else. And if they're wrong, they're wrong, all right? So Tychicus, if you do a simple search in the Bible, you learn from Acts 20, verse 4, that he is called an Asian, which he would be an Eastern Asian, so not like Asian as we know it in our culture today. And in that verse, he is coupled with a guy named Trophimus, sorry, who is an Ephesian. And so in Acts 21, we learn that Trophimus is an Ephesian. And in Acts 20, they're coupled together as Asian. And so it's a big possibility that Tychicus was from Ephesus or one of the surrounding areas. And if that is true, that means that the readers would have known Tychicus. And so Tychicus comes with this letter and they would have welcomed him openly because they absolutely would have known who he is. Very well could have been a part of this congregation, but Paul was using him for other purposes. And so they knew this guy, which is huge, because when you know someone, you have a level of trust with them that is far greater than a stranger. Right? Think about it. If someone you know comes to your house, you're going to welcome them in a little bit different than someone who's a stranger. And that's exactly what's happening here. He sends Tychicus to the Ephesians because the Ephesians know him. And so one of the reasons that Paul used Tychicus is potentially to write the letter and absolutely to deliver the letter is because they knew him on a relational level. And so my question for you today, first question, is do people know you? We live in a very individualistic, cut-off culture where many of us don't like to let people in, do we? We don't have front porches anymore. We have backyards that are fenced. Right? Why? To, to keep those people out. Right? But what's happened is, is all of a sudden, we've become a culture where people don't actually know us on a deep, intimate level anymore. And so the question you need to ask yourself is, do people actually know you? Or are you just skating by because you don't think people care or want to know you? Now, Paul tells us three reasons in his final words why he used Tychicus to deliver this letter. Uh, Hopefully you caught it. First, He used Tychicus because he was a beloved brother. Second, because he was a faithful minister in the Lord. And third, because he encouraged people's hearts. And so, first, he was a beloved brother. He was beloved, which means he was dearly loved and cherished by Paul. Maybe you have someone in your life who you would call beloved in your life. And he was a brother as well. So he was a beloved and he was a brother, which means that he had the same heart and the same desire as Paul to see the gospel spread throughout all the nations. And because he had the same heart and desire, Paul had the utmost confidence that Tychicus would succeed in his mission in delivering this letter to the Ephesian church and to let them know how Paul is doing. And so he was cherished and he was in unity with Paul. Paul. And so Paul says, listen, I sent Tychicus to you because he's a beloved brother. That's the first thing. Second, not only was he a beloved brother, but he was also a faithful minister in the Lord, which means that he was, he also believed in the same message, the true message of the gospel. Paul had confidence that Tychicus would, could help the church if they had questions about the letter or the gospel. In in Paul's day, uh, we read this in Galatians, there's a lot of people called the Judaizers who would come after him, and they would say all these things that weren't true to the gospel. And so Paul had to find absolutely faithful people to the gospel to do his work for him because he's in prison at this point. 
right? So he couldn't just send anybody. He had to send someone who was faithful to the gospel, faithful to the mission that Paul was doing. And so he knew Tychicus was faithful. He was a faithful minister. Not only that, not only was he beloved, not only was he a faithful minister, but he also encouraged people's hearts. He encouraged people's hearts. Paul knew that the people in Ephesus did not need a dictator. They did not need an authoritarian. They did not need someone to suppress the church and yell at them for all they're doing wrong and tell them everything they can't do in life. He came with the good news of the gospel. He came with encouragement. He built the church up rather than tearing it down. He helped people understand rather than making them feel bad. He loved, he prayed, he supported these Jewish and Gentile believers. That's huge. Remember, chapter 3 is all about how Jesus broke down the wall of hostility. And that now Gentiles are absolutely welcome in the body of Christ. And so Paul needed someone who could go in and and, and bring this letter in, who would absolutely bring everybody in together and encourage not only the Jewish people, but also the Gentile believers as well within this body of Christ. And so he encouraged people's hearts. And so this makes us ask the question today, how are you like Tychicus? Are you a beloved brother or sister in Christ? A lot of us can say, if you have faith in in Jesus, you are a brother and sister in Christ. But the question is, is are you beloved? There's There's a difference there. You can be a brother and sister in Christ, but not be cherished and loved because of how you treat people. Are you easy to love? Do you share the same heart and desire as the other brothers and sisters in this congregation? Is beloved one of the words that people would describe you as? Next, are you a faithful minister of the Lord? Are you faithful to the true message of the gospel found in God's word? Are you true to the Lord and his mission that he has for you in this life? The, that word faithful means steadfast affection and allegiance. And so is that you? Do you have steadfast affection and allegiance for our Lord in the gospel? Third, do you encourage people's hearts? Do you tear people down? Or do you build people up? Are you known for your encouragement? Are you known for your bitterness and dissension? I hope that you ask yourself these questions today with sincerity. Since Paul was a prisoner, he used Tychicus to deliver his letter because they knew him, because he was a beloved brother, because he was a faithful minister of the Lord, and because he encouraged people's hearts. Uh, But then the next question we have to ask is, well, how did Tychicus become this way? Like, what happened in Tychicus' life that he was described as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and he encouraged people's hearts? Well, most likely because Paul first modeled the gospel to him. Paul was a model for Tychicus to imitate. Do you realize that? There's no reason Paul's going to send Tychicus to do this job if Paul first didn't model for him what the gospel is like. He modeled what a beloved brother looks like. He modeled what a faithful minister looks like. He modeled what an encourager looks like. But not only that, he didn't just model it and say, hey, watch me the whole time. He also then taught the gospel to him. He went the, the next step. He didn't just say, hey, just learn what I do. No, he intentionally turned toward Tychicus and, and taught him the gospel. How to be a beloved brother. How to be a faithful minister. How to be an encourager. He entrusted Tychicus with the gospel and his mission. Paul modeled and Paul taught so that Tychicus could be a valuable tool for the glory of God and for the sake of others. And that's exactly what he was used for. He's not only mentioned in Ephesians, he's also mentioned the same thing in the Colossian church. And so this is what Tychicus is known for and used for. And so this makes us ask next, who is your Tychicus? So not only how are you like Tychicus, but who is your Tychicus in your life? Who are you modeling the gospel to? Hopefully, first and foremost, parents, it's your kids. 
grandparents, hopefully it's your grandchildren. Right? What younger believer the, the need what younger believer in your life do you need to model the gospel to? And not only that, not, it's not just a watching and imitating thing, but also who do you intentionally need to teach? Who do you need to teach the gospel to in your life? Let me tell you, it can't all come from me. I don't have enough time and energy for every single one of you. Right? I don't. Plain and simple. I can do this every single Sunday, but it goes past this because you guys have all week out there, and so we all need to share the load in, in modeling and teaching the gospel to the next people so that the gospel will continue to move far after you're gone. And so who is your Tychicus? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves time and time again. How are you like Tychicus, and who is your Tychicus in your life? Next, he closes his letter with a final blessing, and he ends where he begins. I'm going to read it again, 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This should sound familiar because he already prayed this for his readers to experience these things in Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul uh, ends here where he began, praying for the same exact things for this church he ends where he begins but what's amazing is that these blessings that he prayed for at the beginning and the end are also key themes throughout his whole letter and so hopefully you got the gist of this as we went through this whole series. Uh, first, let's, let's think about peace. Well, in chapter 314, he says that Jesus himself is our peace. In 317, he says Jesus preached peace. In 43, he said we need to be eager to maintain the bond of peace. And so peace is found at the beginning, is found at the middle, and is found at the end of this letter. Love. In 2.4, He says, because of the great love in which he loved us, but God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love in which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. 4.2, he says, we need to bear with one another in love. 5.1, he says, we need to walk in love. And so love is found at the beginning, love is found in the middle, and love is found at the end. What about faith? Well, in Ephesians 2, that's a big faith chapter, 2 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is found throughout this letter. What about grace? Grace in 1 6, to the praise of his glorious ga- grace. In 2 5, by grace you have been saved. Grace is found through this whole letter. Now, here's my point. Since these are blessings that he prays for at the beginning, middle, and end of his letter, we should probably really focus on these words in our lives, shouldn't we? These are four words that we should absolutely focus on in our Christian lives. And yet, how often do we get distracted by secondary issues of doctrine, all the while neglecting peace, love, faith, and grace? Yet, how often do we get distracted by our own preferences that we neglect peace, love, faith, and grace? I could go on. How often do we get distracted by the world when when, when we neglect peace, love, faith, and grace? How often do we simply forget who we are and what we have received through Christ? His peace, His love, His faith, and His grace. Listen, church, this should not be so. Peace should be a fruit that we bear in our lives to the point that when people are around you, they leave more peaceful. Love should be a fruit that we bear in our lives to the point where you are known and defined by the way you love God and the way you love others. 
Faith should be a fruit that we bear in our lives to the point where our faithfulness is evident in all we do and in everything we go through, the highs and also the lows. And grace should be a characteristic that is on display in everything we do to the point that the grace of Christ just absolutely exudes from us in life. Peace, love, faith, and grace should define us. Each one of us and us as a church. Now let's go a little bit further and actually think about what these four words look like for you and me. How do they apply to us? Well, what does peace look like for you and me? First, it looks like reconciliation. It looks like reconciliation. Peace will only be possible when you realize that you now have been reconciled with God. I love 2 Corinthians 5.18. It says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I love this I love this verse, and here's why. Because from God through Christ, we have been reconciled to him, okay? First and foremost, you have to understand that. But then he gives us the ministry of reconciliation for others, correct? And so when we realize that we have been reconciled with God, we can then strive to be reconciled with each other. And so how many of you haven't forgiven someone yet? How many of you in this room, with maybe someone in this room, you have yet to forgive because of some past hurt that you haven't talked with them about? That shouldn't be so. We have the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of unforgiveness. This is what he wants his readers and us to experience. Reconciliation, peace. Peace with God first. First and foremost, understand that we have been reconciled through Christ to God. But second, we need to be reconciled with each other. And when that happens, when you realize that you've been reconciled with God and that you can be reconciled with each other, guess what? Then you're going to feel peace within. You're going to feel peace within. And so, ask yourself today, have you experienced reconciliation from God? I sure hope so. I sure hope you have experienced the peace that only comes through Christ. And if that's the case, has that made you a more peaceful person? Or do you just love to make people mad? I don't know. Second, what does love look like for you and me? Love is the source and the outflow of reconciliation. So once you understand your peace with God and peace with others, then out of love, I'm sorry, out of reconciliation flows our love for other people. We would not have peace with God without the great love of God, which he has loved us. We would not have peace with others without the love of Christ that brought us near and broke down the wall of hostility. That we would not have peace within without the love of Christ guarding our hearts and our minds. This is what he wants his readers to experience. Love, which is the source of our peace. And so my next question for you is, have you experienced God's love. You look at chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. So out of God's great love, you have been made alive. Have you experienced that in your life? Have you been saved by grace through faith? If so, has that made you a more loving person? Are you a more loving person in life because of the love in which God has loved you? Next, what does faith look like for you and me? When Paul says the phrase, I love this phrase, he says, peace to the brothers and love with faith. Love with faith. When he says that, he is referring to the faith that they already have. All right? They already have this faith because remember, faith is a gift of God as is salvation. This is what he wants his readers to experience. He wants faithfulness to God and the gospel and this faith needs to be coupled with love. 
This faith needs to be coupled with love. He wants them to keep the faith in everything they do. Do you guys remember in 2 Timothy, he said he kept the faith. Paul kept the faith. It doesn't mean that he was not going to believe in Jesus anymore. It meant that he stayed true to Jesus in everything he did. That's what it means to have faith with love. He wants them to keep the faith. All the while, verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, all the while walking in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And so have you experienced faith in Jesus Christ? I sure hope so. I sure hope that you have an immense faith in Jesus Christ. Understanding that he loved us so much and he gave himself up for us as a sacrifice to God so that we may have life and life eternal. And then is your faith coupled with love? Faith and love. Those two are uh, two sides of one coin. Faith and love. And then next, what does grace look like for you and me? Well, just doing a survey of Ephesians first. It's by grace that we've been chosen. It's by grace that we've been adopted. It's by grace that we've been redeemed. It's by grace that we have an inheritance. It's by grace that we have been saved. It's by grace that we have been brought near. And it's by grace that we have been forgiven. Amen? We are products of grace. Do you understand that? You are a product of grace. And since we are products of grace, what then should happen? We must be gracious to others in all we do. And so ask yourself, have you experienced the grace of God in your life? I sure hope so. And if that's the case, has that made you a more gracious person? Do you guys understand what I'm getting at here? The gospel truths of Jesus Christ, His peace, His love, His faith, and His grace all should motivate the way that we are in our lives. The peace we show, the love we show, the faith we have, and the grace we show. But the last thing we need to really understand is that this all comes from God. All of it. Peace, love, faith, and grace to God be the glory to the praise of His glorious grace, to the praise of His glory, we have received peace, love, faith, and grace. And so the last question I have for you is, have you experienced God in your life? I sure hope so. I sure hope so, because if you have, then are you displaying God in your life? Because everything you've experienced, there are, Ten more people out there that need to experience God from you. If you've experienced God, I hope that you can then take God and his peace and his love and his faith and his grace and and display that to people in your life. So if you experience God, are you displaying God in your life? Now, after everything we've read and covered in this letter, we are left with one last verse, verse 24. It says, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This is the first and only time that the Ephesians' love for Christ is mentioned. Every other time love is mentioned in Ephesians, it's all about God's love for us. But this is the the only time where it's referencing the Ephesians' love for God. He closes his letter by focusing on their personal love and relationship with Christ. He says, grace be to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that name that Paul gives for Jesus here. He could have just said Christ. He could have just said Jesus. He could have just said Christ Jesus. But no, he says the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most formal name for Jesus given in all of Scripture. First, the name Lord is a reference to his divine nature. And so what he's proclaiming in that word is that Jesus is God. The name Jesus is a reference to his humanity. And so he wants us to know that Jesus is God with us, who came to be one of us. 
And then the name Christ is a reference to his messiahship or his anointed, that he is the anointed one. And so Jesus is the anointed, chosen God-man who came to save the world through his death and his resurrection. This is who we love. You understand that? We don't love some fairy out there who has no power over this world. We don't love some mere man or we don't love some far deity who doesn't care about us. We love our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God who came to us as the anointed one to save people, you and me, from their sins. That's who we love. Is this the Jesus that you love? Do you have a full understanding of who He is? And is your love for Him incorruptible? Or, in other words, is your love for Him undying, steadfast, never-ending? His ending statement makes us ask that question I started with. Do you love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love? I sure hope so. Because that's the way that he loves you. With an undying love. So what's your next move? I told you I was going to end every message like this all year. All right? So here we go. What's your next move? How does this apply to us? Okay? I've asked you so many questions today. I hope one sticks in your mind at least. Okay? Okay? It's kind of like fishing. One will land, all right, somewhere, some way. I've asked you a lot of questions, but here's some practical application steps you can take home with you. Hopefully, what's your next move for this year? What, what are you going to do in your life in light of what we learned in Scripture? First, be more like Tychicus. Okay, church? Be a beloved brother or sister in Christ. Be a faithful minister to the gospel, meaning keep the faith in all you do. And and absolutely be an encourager of hearts. Please encourage people. Build people up instead of tearing them down. There's already enough of that in our life, isn't there? We don't need it from each other. I'm not saying that's happening, okay? I know it sounds like it's happening here. I don't don't think it is, but, but truly, We don't need it here. Build people up. Build each other up. Build people up out there. Be more like Tychicus. Next, find your Tychicus. I know I say this all the time, but listen, you need to practically, intentionally think about someone in your life whom you can model the gospel to and whom you can teach the gospel to. And it can't be programmed through this church all the time. It doesn't have to be a church program. Because guess what? You're the church. You get to do this. Day in and day out, week in and week out, intentionally with your kids, with your spouses, with your friends, with someone who may be interested in Jesus but doesn't know anything yet. Those are the best opportunities we can have to share the gospel with people. Find your ticket kiss and pour into their lives. Next, I pray that you experience the peace, love, faith, and grace that only comes from God. Now, I don't say this only to experience it at salvation, but I I pray that you experience this daily through God's word and through prayer with God. Experience his peace by praying and, and reading. Experience his love and his faith and his grace by praying and reading and then also worshiping together with other believers experience it in your life and if you experience it in your life then display it if you've experienced this from god peace love faith and grace now we get to go and do those things so display peace be a peaceful person be a loving person be a faithful person be a gracious person i pray that this is how people would know you by your peace, by your love, by your faith, by your grace. And last, I pray you love the Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. But in order for it to be an undying love, you need to know who Jesus actually is. He's the Lord. He's God. 
He's Jesus. He's man. He came to be with us. And he's the Christ, the one who came to save sinners from their sins. Let's pray. God, there's so much here at the end of this letter. And we thank you for the entire letter as a whole. That you have kept it all these years for us to read it in your word. God, I pray that you would write these words on our hearts. I pray that what we learn, the gospel truths we learn through this letter, would then be applied to our living in everything we do. Help us to walk worthy to the calling to which we have been called. God, this is for your glory and for the grace of others. We pray this in your name. Amen.